and then we'll go ahead uh, and jump in. Welcome everyone. Um, really glad that you're all here today uh, for our workshop on authority as constructed and contextual. Um, just a quick note, um, all participants are automatically muted um, or sorry, will be in a second. Uh, yes, yeah, so all participants are automatically muted, um, but if you do have any questions or comments that you would like to share, uh, please go ahead and add those into the chat box and we will be monitoring that throughout the workshop today. So our topic today is uh, authority is constructed and contextual. And to get us started, we're gonna jump right in with a poll. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. Hopefully you all should be seeing this now. There are two questions here. Um, and it's just basically asking you uh, your level of agreement with each of these statements. So we'll give everyone 30 seconds or so to add their responses in to the poll questions. And we'll give it about uh, 10 more seconds to let everyone um, enter the responses to the poll. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and end that poll and we will share the results with everyone. So hopefully everyone should now be seeing the results. Uh, so you can see that we have um, really good agreement that uh, many students have difficulty identifying authority or authoritative or credible sources. Um, and we also have a very strong agreement that uh, most students do not critically consider the context when, de when determining which sources to use. Right, so thank you all for your responses to those. So um, as you'll have noticed, now both of those questions are um, focused on issues related to the authority of information sources, um, which is really the topic of our workshop today. So we're going to be looking at this concept of authority as constructed and contextual and looking at it in terms of the way it is presented as a concept in the framework for information literacy for higher education. Uh, we'll be looking at um, possible student learning bottlenecks or um, issues that students may have that could be related to their understanding of this concept or maybe uh, a lack of understanding of this concept. And then we will look at different strategies, activities, and assignments that um, you can use to teach uh, this concept. Um, for anyone who is new to our workshop series, uh, my name is Jane Hammonds. I am assistant professor in the university libraries. I'm the teaching and learning engagement librarian and my email is hammonds.73 at osu.edu. Um, please feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or comments after the workshop. I'm always happy to talk more about these issues. Um, I do wanna take a second to thank Stephanie Founds, who is my colleague in the teaching and learning department, who is monitoring the chat today, and she'll be sharing throughout the workshop um, links uh, to things that I refer to during the workshop. So you can always go to that chat to access any of those links that you see on the screen. Um, and if you do have questions or comments throughout the workshop, please feel free to add those into the chat and we will be pausing at various points throughout um, to go and uh, look at that chat. I um, also wanted to take just a, a, a minute to ask uh, or to encourage everyone, if you would like to go ahead and download this action plan document for authority as constructed and contextual. Um, we will be referring to this uh, at several times throughout the workshop and um, giving everyone a chance to, um, some, uh, to fill out their, their document, put their answers in, share their thoughts on their worksheet. Um, this is not at all required, um, but we are trying to make this um, as active as a workshop can be during a, you know, for an hour long virtual workshop. And we did want to have everyone have the chance to leave the workshop with, you know, a plan or at least some action steps in hand of how they might want to um, 
uh, incorporate this concept into their, their courses or their instruction. So um, if you want to, to download that, it is optional, but it is a great way to go as you're going through to be able to, to uh, writing down your, your thoughts um, on this concept. And Stephanie has shared that link in the, the chat. Um, So we will go ahead. Um, so those of you that have been to one of our workshops before, I um, hope you'll forgive me if I'll take just a second to, to give a little context for anyone who may be new. Um, this is the fourth workshop in um, our series that is focused on information literacy concepts that are described in a document called the Framework for Information Literacy for Higher Education. Uh, the framework was published by the Association of College and Research Libraries in 2015 as a way to provide an updated and expanded definition of information literacy. Um, and so the framework highlights six core information literacy concepts that are considered to be really crucial to students as they are developing their information literacy. Um, so without an understanding of these sort of core underlying concepts, many of the things that we ask students to do when we think about research or inquiry-based assignments, may not really make a lot of sense to them. Um, and these are things, uh, these are concepts that expert researchers understand, that we as instructors, as scholars, um, people who are experts in our field, who have done a lot of research and scholarship, we understand these concepts, um, sometimes without even realizing that we do. Um, but these are things that students may not yet fully have grasped, and it may create some of the the frustrations or the challenges that we see related to, to students completing research or inquiry-based assignments. Okay. Uh, so the, the previous uh, three concepts that we discussed were scholarship as conversation, um, information has value, and research as inquiry. If you did miss those workshops, um, they are available. Um, uh, the videos as well as workshop materials are all available and the links for those will be made available. Um, and I'll also send an email to everyone after the workshop um, with links to those as well. So we'll jump in and take a look more closely at authority as constructed and contextual. Um, so we're going to go ahead and watch a short video that uh, provides a good overview, I hope, of this concept. Hopefully everyone will be able to hear it. Mm -hmm. This is Jared. For a presentation in his religious studies course, he was required to analyze the depiction of Christianity in a well-known film and to support his analysis with at least three authoritative sources. At the end of his presentation, Jared read a statement made by his personal pastor and cited this statement as one of his sources. When he received his grade, he was confused when his instructor informed him that his pastor does not count as an authoritative source. In this situation, Jared is struggling to understand that authority is constructive and contextual. To grasp this concept, students must understand that the value of an information source is related to the credibility of the author or creator, and that there are a variety of factors that provide someone authority, which could include education or social position. At the same time, however, the student must also understand that the type of authority needed can vary according to context. In his community, Jared's pastor is considered an authority. But in the context in which he is giving his presentation, his professor expects him to use the types of sources that are considered to be authoritative in the academic environment. For the instructor, it's natural to consider an advanced degree as a primary indicator of authority. But for Jared, who is still developing his information literacy, the notion that there are different types of authority is new. However, once he comes to understand that authority is constructed and contextual, Jared will be better able to evaluate information sources in order to select sources that are appropriate for his information need. Okay. So I think that uh, hopefully we'll give a good overview of this concept. And I did wanna take a second to mention, I've had a few people at, that have seen this video ask me about this situation. Um, and I did wanna to, to clarify that this was an actual situation um, that I 
experience. Uh, my first professional job as a librarian was at a small school in southeastern Kentucky in a very um, religious community. And I was invited to watch some presentations that students were doing for one of their religious studies classes. Um, and this situation happened. And it was completely, to me, someone who had not been raised in a, a religious environment at all, it was a, a stunning moment. And it really helped to clarify for me this idea that authority, authority is constructed and contextual. Um, so I just wanted to share that um, with everyone before we move on. Um, so what we'd like to do now is um, have you all take a second to, based on what you've seen and what you've heard so far, in your own words, um, how you would describe the concept of authority as constructed and contextual. Um, and if you did download the action plan document, there is space on that action plan document where you can write your thoughts in there about how you would describe this concept. Um, you can also share your thoughts in the chat box as well, how you would describe um, what you see as the, the major points of this concept. So we'll give everyone a minute to um, jot down their thoughts, however they would like to do that. Um, and then we will go forward. I'm just gonna check the chat box really quickly. Um, while people are thinking and writing. So we did see in the chat, just uh, to share with everyone, um, one of our participants was asking about um, having librarians give guest lectures in courses this fall. Um, and uh, we do recommend that you reach out specifically to your subject librarian. We're working out now um, how library instruction will be handled in the fall, but it will um, uh, likely be uh, up to the individual instruction librarian um, or the subject librarian how they um, decide to go about working with their courses. So definitely go ahead and reach out to your subject librarian if you have any questions about that. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead then. Um, right, so as you saw in the video, authority is constructed and contextual is this, this concept that all information sources have some type of authority, um, but different types of sources, different sources have different levels of authority. And that, that authority is due, at least in part, to the credibility of the creator of that information source. And there can be many factors that contribute to given, giving someone the authority to speak on that particular topic. Um, and that, that uh, it could be their education, it could be their advanced degree, it could be their experience, their particular social position, some sort of combination of these factors that give someone authority to speak on a particular topic and be um, considered a credible information source, right? This authority is often constructed over time. So it's, it's through publishing multiple articles on a topic or through their um, experience in a particular field over a, a, an amount of time that someone develops the authority to speak on that particular topic. Okay. So experts, so we as instructors, as scholars, as researchers, we recognize that the context has a lot to do with determining um, what type of authority is needed. So what gives a source authority and what type of authority might be needed at that particular um, situation. Certain things that may be considered authoritative in one field or in one uh, situation may not be considered authoritative in another, right? And that different communities have different uh, types of authority or may recognize different types of authority. Um, and communities is in quotation marks there because communities can be very broadly defined. So a discipline may be thought of as community. Different disciplines may recognize different types of authority. Different professions may recognize different types of authority. Um, so, Experts, because of this understanding that um, there's many different levels of authority to information sources and understanding the role of context, recognize um, you know, how important it is to evaluate information sources and to consider authority 
um, as part of that evaluation process and consider the context in which they are using that information um, to help them determine what level of authority might be needed. Um, experts also understand that uh, you know, this is not a perfect world, and so certain types of authority may be privileged above other types of authority. Um, and, you know, certain people may be able to speak on a topic with authority that other people, for various reasons, do not, um, are not sort of endowed with that same level of authority. And so it's really important to not only evaluate and think about authority, but also think about um, those uh, circumstances that may in some way impact who is considered an authority and who is not. So in summary, um, authority is constructed and contextual is this concept from the framework that holds that information sources have different levels of authority um, and that authority is related to the information creator, the expertise of that creator, um, and different types of uh, uh, the context can have an important role in determining what is considered authoritative and what is not considered authoritative. Right? And I know that um, for a lot of us, as we're going through this, you may be sitting there thinking, well, yeah, of course, this makes total sense. This is, uh, you know, um, this is something that I know. This is something that I understand. Um, and one of the things that the framework really emphasizes is that um, once you sort of develop an understanding of these concepts, it's really hard to see it from the perspective of someone who has not. So because we are instructors, because we are researchers, because we are scholars, this is, some, this is an understanding that we've developed. We know this. Um, but many of our students who are just starting out, it may not be quite as clear to them. Um, but it, be, can, it can be challenging for us to see from the perspective of someone who doesn't have the same experience that we have um, and, and to recognize this idea that, you know, this source that's perfectly fine for me to use in one situation is not fine for me to use in another situation. Okay. So we'll take a second to pause right there to see if there are any questions or any comments um, in general related to the, to the concept. I'll go ahead and check the chat box. So Jennifer shared, um, someone of authority isn't always going to give accurate information, rather information led by their own beliefs. That is a, a great, great point, Jennifer. Um, just because someone is a recognized authority does not necessarily mean that the information that they are sharing is credible. Absolutely. Um, and that's part of, uh, that's, we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Um, but this idea of, of challenging authority in some way is also included in this concept. So critically considering what gave them that authority and whether or not, um, you know, that means that they, we can trust what they are saying. Right. Uh, Danny shared, uh, some consider reaching out to dom domain experts as a proper authority. Um, thoughts on balancing that against the video. Um, not quite sure what you're getting at there, Danny, but maybe we can talk about that um, later on, or you could clarify a little bit uh, more about what your question is. Um, so any other questions before we move on? Okay. So, now that we've had an overview of this concept, um, I wanted to give everyone a chance to uh, think about how a lack of understanding of this concept may be contributing in some way to the challenges that uh, you have been seeing in your students. Um, is there anything that you can point to looking at what your students have done in the past? You can think, oh, maybe it's because they're not quite getting this concept. Um, or uh, looking at it in a different perspective, for, you know, once students really do gra grasp this concept, what, what will they understand that maybe they didn't understand before? Or what parts of the research process, or what are the things that we ask them to do um, that might make more sense to them? Um, and again, this is a moment where if you, if you did download the action plan, you can go ahead and uh, share your thoughts on your action plan. Um, or you can also share your thoughts in the chat box. Um, and we'll just give a minute for everyone to reflect and think about how they might be seeing this playing out um, in, in their own students.
So Brian shared, um, it does explain students citing a blog as a source in a paper. Yes. Right. Um, seeing a source, hey, that source seems like it answers my question. I'm going to use that source and not really thinking about, you know, what type of source it is and whether it's the appropriate type of source to be citing in a paper. Um, Saida shared, students do not see themselves as authority when they prepare a research paper. They usually feel overwhelmed. That is a great point. Um, coming to recognize themselves as having authority can be a real challenge for students. Um, and also recognizing what makes an authority in particular, you know, disciplines or fields. Um, who are the people that are generally known and trusted in this field um, that you can look for, look at to, as, you know, places to get started. Mm -hmm. So Peggy shared, if a source says what they want, it's a good source. Yes, I think uh, we've all seen that, right? I'm gonna use this source because it seems to, to do what I, I need it to do, even if it's not a great you know, source overall. I, I know I've had students cite uh, websites that are meant for you know, middle school and elementary school children because it had the, the information that they wanted. Um, Um, Nick shared, uh, leaning on authority figures to themselves rather than academic authorities. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What they have recognized or think about as an authority um, and instead of academic authorities. Um, so understanding that popular media isn't authoritative in an academic context, definitely. Um, Brian, hopefully they learn that they, uh, they seem to know more than me, doesn't make the source an actual expert. Yes, and we'll talk about uh, that a little bit more too later on. Uh, just because someone says they're an expert doesn't mean that they are one or seems like an expert. Um, yeah, absolutely, great. Uh, we'll go ahead. Um, and in this next part of the workshop, I wanted to look very briefly at um, some potential student learning bottlenecks that could be related to this concept. Um, and many of these are things that you are already mentioning um, in, in the chat and that we've already been discussing. Um, bottlenecks for anyone that is not familiar with that term basically just is a way to refer to those places where students tend to get stuck and sort of a research or inquiry based process um, where you might see over and over again each semester students making the same mistakes. Um, those can be considered those bottlenecks, sort of those stuck places. So some potential student learning bottlenecks related to this concept, and again, many of these are things that you've already been mentioning. Um, part of this is related to the search tools that they use. Um, this recognition that not all search tools are made the same, and that to locate the kinds of sources that they may need to use in academic research or later in their careers that there may be within their fields particular um, search tools or information resources that are considered authoritative in that field. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, this, that basic Google search is gonna get them a lot of results, but it may not get them the types of results that are considered authoritative um, in that field or in that discipline. And so they may need to use specialized search tools. Um, this has already been mentioned, but this academic authority that, you know, in the academic world or in their professional worlds that they enter, um, they may need sources with different types of authority that they would use in their, you know, in their regular personal life. Um, and so recognizing the need for that. Um, also that, you know, authoritative sources may differ by discipline. You know, what is considered authoritative in one one field may not be the same as in the other in other fields. Um, and so as they enter that field or enter those professions, learning to recognize who are the authorities or what are the authoritative, authoritative types of sources in this field, what are the authoritative places to go to find information, um, that can definitely be challenging. Um, so evaluating sources, and again, a lot of the stuff that we've already been talking about has been related to evaluated, evaluating sources, but, you know, identifying various types of authority, what makes people authority, authorities, what gives them authority, um, what are the markers of authority when you are looking at a particular information source. Um, and this is something I see a lot with students, you know, having them look at a PDF of a journal article and um, saying, you know, you know, 
What do we know about the author based on this? What journal is this from? And a lot of times they struggle even to pull out information like what the journal title is, even when looking at the PDF of an article. They don't really know where to go to look for that information in an article. So identifying what those markers of authority are and how to recognize those in whatever information source that they're looking at. Um, container collapse. So this idea that almost everything that we um, use now is an online source um, and everything tends to look the same. Everything kind of looks like a website or, a, you know, a news article. And so a lot of the more traditional markers um, that would you could use to distinguish between sources don't really exist online. And so it can be more challenging for students to identify what type of source it is and to recognize how that source type might um, indicate or not indicate authority. Um, the checklist evaluation approach, and this is something we're going to talk more about in a second, um, but a lot of students um, are ta taught to use a very basic kind of checklist evaluation approach where they um, kind of look at a few different factors of a source. Um, and uh, oftentimes the things that I've seen students tend to focus on is the date of the source and the web domain of the source. Um, and they don't actually look a lot at the content of the source. Um, and so helping students to kind of move beyond this checklist approach, I think can be challenging. Um, and part of that is thinking about how we can teach lateral reading. Um, students, when they do source evaluation, often stick to the source itself. So if it's an article or a website, they stay on that particular source and use it to evaluate the source rather than looking across multiple sites um, to get more information about that. And again, we're gonna talk more about lateral reading in a second. Um, and then this was, has already been mentioned, but be, being skeptical. Being skeptical um, when someone says they're an authority doesn't mean that they are. Um, you know, and that expertise in one area does not indicate expertise in another area, right? So someone could be, you know, a, a, an expert at, you know, a, an expert physicist, but does that mean that their opinions on, you know, um, politics should necessarily count? Um, so recognizing the need to, even as we wanna, want them to be looking for those indicators of authority, um, recognizing that that still doesn't necessarily mean that the sources that they are using may be credible. So they do have to be skeptical um, of the, the, the source, skeptical of that authority. Okay. So we'll pause again here um, and this will be well, just another chance to think of any additional bottlenecks related to this concepts that you might have seen in your students. Um, any bottlenecks that I haven't mentioned that you can think of. Um, you can add your thoughts to your action plan if you would like to do that again or you can share those in the um, the chat but we'll just pause here for just another second um, to give people time to think a little bit more about this and then we'll move on um, and look at the knowledge practices and dispositions related to this concept well so we'll take a quick pause here let me check the chat So Danny shared, students using JSTOR for everything. Yes, students tend to, they, they learn one database when they're in high school that, you know, JSTOR or whatever database they is, and then they use that database for everything. If they know how to use it, they're gonna use that database, even if it's not the most appropriate one for their particular topic. Um, Kathy shared, I agree that one of the biggest problems with student search occurs in that they do not understand how to do productive library searches and which tool search engines resources will lead them to locate authoritative sources. I feel oftentimes as those students give up easily or sell out to the first materials that they find. Absolutely, Kathy. Um, you've probably heard the phrase before, but uh, satisficing, right? They find a tool that, uh, you know, it, it's good enough for them. It's not the best source that they could find, um, but it's going to be good enough. They're going to just find the, the, the first sources that they can that seem to work. Okay. Uh, Danny shared, uh, some students are still using the old .com rule and have even dismissed scholarly journal articles because it's on a .com site. Yes, um, website evaluation by domain name is something that a lot of students have been taught and it just doesn't work. Um, we're going to look at the .org situation as well later, but um, going by just the domain name to decide whether or not a source is trustworthy or not. For some reason, a lot of students have really absorbed that um, and it really just doesn't work. Um, 
Jasper shared, even in academic space, many students don't look up the authors, right? Many of the bigger name authors have other companies, patents, or clinical practices that bias their work, which is okay if the reader knows how the researcher is biased. Yes, the importance of looking up their, the authors of their sources, looking up the journals of their sources to learn more about those. We're going to talk more about that later, but recognizing, you know, the factors that may contribute to making that source um, to the bias in that source and being able to recognize that. Um, and I agree with you that you can, you know, it's perfectly fine to use a source that is biased as long as you recognize that and take um, account of that in your, your work. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on. So uh, the framework highlights what they call knowledge practices and dispositions uh, related to each of the core concepts that they mention. So knowledge practices can basically be thought of more of actions um, and dispositions or ways of thinking or habits um, that students start to demonstrate once they develop an understanding of this concept. And I wanna highlight a few of these here because I think these are great, great places to go one if you're trying to think about specific bottlenecks that students might have related to this topic, the knowledge practices and dispositions kind of highlight many of those bottlenecks because they are the things that students should be able to do or to think um, if they understand this concept. Uh, the knowledge practices and dispositions are also great ways to go. They're not necessarily meant to be learning outcomes but they can very easily be transformed into learning outcomes. So I wanted to highlight a few of these related to um, authority is constructed and contextual. So as students are developing their understanding of this concept, as we talked about, learning to define different types of authority, um, such as sub subject expertise, social position, or special experience, learning how to use those indicators of authority to determine the credibility of sources, but also understanding the elements that might temper that credibility, um, and recognizing that authoritative content may be packaged in different formats and may include a variety of different types of sources. Um, one of the things that I've seen related to that is once students learn about scholarly articles, um, sometimes they get to thinking that they have to use scholarly articles in every situation, that those are the only type of authoritative sources. And so whenever they're in a situation where they can't use scholarly articles, maybe they're researching a really new topic that really doesn't have a lot written about it, then they really struggle to identify what authoritative source might be if they can't rely on that, um, that scholarly peer review um, as the main indicator of whether or not a source is scholarly. Um, some of the dispositions, uh, motivating themselves to find authoritative sources, and this is something that's already been mentioned. Students tend to be satisfied, it seems like, um, with just the first sources that they find rather than taking that time to really locate and uh, look at their sources to determine authority. Uh, learning to question those traditional notions of granting authority, um, and part of this could be, you know, thinking critically about the peer review process, um, and whether or not, you know, peer review really indicates that a source is authoritative or credible. Um, and then developing the understanding of how their own biases, their own perspective might um, impact what they consider to be authoritative or not authoritative. So again, I just wanted to highlight those um, knowledge practices and dispositions because I think they can be helpful as you are thinking about uh, specific bottlenecks that you may be seeing in your students or specific um, competencies or ways of thinking that you want your students to develop related to this concept. Um, so I wanted to take just another minute here um, to give you a chance to um, highlight any of those knowledge practices or dispositions that you find uh, that are really relevant to your students. Um, the link to a full list of those is available, um, and Stephanie will share that in the uh, chat box. Um, but we'll just give uh, just a minute uh, again, and if you want to um, add your responses to your action plan or share those in the chat box. Uh,
So we'll give everyone just a few more seconds. Um, if they wanna go ahead and take a look at those uh, knowledge practices and dispositions and highlight the ones that they find most relevant. And then in the last part of the workshop, we're gonna look at various activities and assignments um, that we might be able to use to um, help students develop their understanding of this concept. So Brian shared, um, students often struggle with motivate themselves to find authoritative sources. Um, recognizing that authority may be conferred or manifested in unexpected ways because the primary goal is to finish quickly. Yes, um, the motivation issue is a real challenge. Um, helping students to recognize that, you know, it is important to take the time to find sources that are more authoritative rather than just, um, you know, going with the first sources that they can find. Right. Um, Megan shared, understanding how to find authoritative sources in situations where peer-reviewed research isn't available or appropriate. Yes, I think that is a definite, definite challenge. Um, that peer-reviewed, you know, becomes sort of like the holy grail almost for students. And yes, that's automatically an indicator of quality. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And if they don't have that, uh, to lean on, then identifying what an authoritative source is, is really challenging. Um, Jennifer shared kids voting would be a great example. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to there, Jennifer, so if you want to share a little bit more information um, there, that would be great. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and look at some of the um, assignments and activities that might be helpful. Um, so we don't have time to go in depth in, in most any of these assignments, but um, all of the assignments um, are fuller versions are available to you. So uh, we'll be sharing after and Stephanie will also share um, in the chat now where you can go to find full descriptions of these assignments, um, but we'll just briefly highlight some of these um, as we go through. Um, those of you that have been in one of the workshops before know that I always recommend starting, you know, starting small, uh, thinking about small teaching, um, and just having a discussion, um, you know, with students on what factors contribute to making sources authoritative or credible. Um, I, I've done this a lot with students, and this is where they, they tend to bring up this web domain um, as one of the first things that they use. And so it was really helpful to me every time I've done this with students to get, okay, this is how they're thinking about what authoritative sources is. Um, now, what we can, can we do to try to change their thinking a little bit and bring them around a little bit more to seeing authority um, as it is in uh, the academic context. Um, so showing students the video, you, can kind of, you guys kind of did this activity already. You watch the video and then we're um, asked to write a short response based on what you saw. Um, that can be a, another way to get a conversation going on this topic. Um, a true false activity. Again, I always mention these because I've done these so many times with students and I always find it really helpful um, because statements that I will think are perfectly clear to me whether or not it's true or false will be a cause of debate to the students. And so it really often helps me to see the way that they're thinking um, about what makes a particular source authoritative or, or not. And it's a really quick activity that you can do in 15 minutes. Um, you could do it on a discussion board and in a, in a Canvas course, um, but it really kind of helps you to identify some of the misconceptions that students may be holding about um, what makes sources authoritative or what sources are considered appropriate to use um, in the academic uh, context. Um, so some source evaluation resources, and as I mentioned, I do have some, some problems with these kind of checklist approaches to source evaluation. Some of you may be familiar with the CRAAP test, which guides student, students through evaluating sources based on currency, relevancy, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Um, and then a version of this um, that was developed by my colleague, um, Hannah Primo, in the teaching and learning department is DRAMA. So evaluating sources based on date, relevance, accuracy, motivation, and authority. Um, I do think, tend to think that, that using this kind of checklist approach to evaluation can um, keep students at a surface level and they don't really go into the source um, itself. 
Um, but I, as a starting point, I think that these can be helpful. Um, you know, if, if you want to at least make sure that your student, students are doing some evaluation of their sources, thinking a little bit about the sources, having them use one of these checklists with um, any sort of research or inquiry based assignment they have whenever they have to turn in sources um, can be a helpful way to get started at least. And it can at least, the very least, um, I think you would probably get sources that were in a much more appropriate date range um, if you did this. All right. um, so ways to get started, um, but we'll, we'll try to go a little bit further um, as we go through some, uh, more, some of the more, act some additional activities and assignments. So one way I think that you could take that and, and go a little bit further would be to have your students um, in, in uh, working together as a group, create a class document um, which outlines the types of sources that are appropriate to use in that particular source, that particular um, course, or for that specific assignment that you have. So they could uh, take uh, the crab test or drama as examples to get them started, but um, you know, with your support and guidance, they could develop a, um, a model that would be more relevant to that course or that discipline. Um, and then they could incorporate that and use that as part of any assignments that they have where they have to locate sources. Um, and hopefully by having the students work together and think through development of this course specific guideline, um, they might be a little bit more invested in thinking about, um, you know, why those criteria are there and making sure that they're using that to guide their own source evaluation process. Uh, was going to do another poll here, but I know we are we only have about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to actually skip this one for now um, and just keep going through some of the assignments. Um, this is another activity that I've done with students a lot um, where I give them um, a handful of note cards and basically on each card is written a different type of information source. Um, so a scholarly journal article, a news article, encyclopedia articles. Um, I tend to keep it pretty general, but depending on your discipline or your course, you can um, think about the types of sources that are most likely to be used in that field. Um, and then I provide students with a variety of different scenarios where they might use information. Um, and some can be, you know, more um, uh, academic scenarios, some can be more personal scenarios, more professional scenarios, and you can vary these depending on what might work best for your course. Um, and then have them sort the cards, basically, from the, the type of source they think would be most authoritative in that situation to the type of source that they think would be, you know, least authoritative or least appropriate to use in that situation. Um, you know, and having them compare and discuss responses. And this can be really helpful, I think, especially getting at if when you give them a situation um, where it would not be appropriate to use scholarly journal articles or scholarly journal articles probably wouldn't be available. Um, a lot of times I've had students still put as the most authoritative source in that situation, a scholarly journal article. And then we talk through that, you know, why in this particular situation might it not be the most appropriate type of source and what other types of sources could you use in that situation. Um, so there's an activity, I've done this a lot with students and I think it generally always leads to good discussions about types of sources that might be appropriate. Um, this is a similar activity. Um, so in the previous activity, it would actually be written on the card, scholarly journal article, you know, news article. Um, so it would be generic. This is a, a similar activity, but this would be um, giving students actual sources. So giving them the link to, you know, five sources or however many sources would work best. Um, and this can be a mix of websites, journal articles, ebooks, whatever kinds of sources you think would be appropriate. Um, identifying a particular research question or a topic and then looking at the actual specific sources, having students rank the sources um, from the ones that they consider most authoritative to the least authoritative. Um, and then discussing and sharing, you know, how they came up with those rankings, why they felt certain sources were more authoritative than other sources. Um, and comparing any um, disagreements that there might be among groups as to, you know, we thought this was a really great source and we didn't, um, and, you know, having them discuss why. 
Uh, comparing types of authority. This is kind of looking at this in a, in a different way, um, but this is thinking about the type of person or the type of individual that might be considered authority in a different situation. So, um, you know, I've done this before. I describe a bunch of different kind of information needs that people might have, and some could be academic information needs, some could be professional or popular information needs, um, and then have students think about what type of person might have the authority to speak in this situation? What kind of credentials would someone have, would need to be considered an authoritative authority in that situation? Or what type of experience would they need to be considered an authority in that particular situation? And again, this can help students start to think about, you know, um, if you are a student teacher, um, in some of your work that you're doing when you're writing papers for your courses, you need to use, you know, uh, peer-reviewed research articles. But if you are, you know, practicing teaching for the first time and you're having trouble controlling your class, then you can talk to an experienced teacher. Maybe the person, um, you know, is the authority rather than going to that peer-reviewed research. So thinking about the different types of people that might be considered authorities in different situations. Um, another uh, potential activity um, I've done this with students as well, um, giving them two sources to look at, um, written by the same person, um, but one a more um, popular source, like a blog post, and one a peer-reviewed, you know, scholarly research article, and having them discuss when it might be appropriate to use one um, or the other. And in this case, you know, the, the authority of the author is the same. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so they have to think about what other factors might give that source authority or not authority besides the author, um, him or herself. So as I mentioned, um, the domain name uh, as the evaluation process, as part of the evaluation process, is a very common thing that students have been taught. And one of the really persistent um, misconceptions that students have is this idea that if a source is a .org source, that means it is automatically a good source. Um, and this is a great article that I recently found that talks about how anyone can get a .org website. All you have to do is pay for it. You don't have to be an organization. Many of the organizations that do have .org websites are those that are not really credible organizations, or um, in fact, a, a good number of them, uh, .org sites are registered to groups that would be considered hate groups. Um, and so having students read this article and think about this idea of why domain name is not really the, the way to go when thinking about evaluation of sources. Right. Um, lateral reading. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this term. Some of you may not be familiar with this term. Um, this is a different way to think about source evaluation. So uh, the traditional method of source evaluation that kind of goes with the, the checklist approach is vertically um, looking at a source. So you take the source and you look at it basically from top to bottom and you closely and deeply evaluate that source itself. But you don't ever leave that page or you don't ever leave that article or that source. Lateral reading is this idea of looking at a source across multiple websites or multiple pages, right? So you might open a website, but then you Google, um, you know, that, uh, that website. You Google the author. You keep opening pages. You look for that story in different places. And so looking across multiple sites rather than focusing on one site as part of the evaluation process. Excuse me. Um, and this is something that you could do with peer review articles as well. Um, you know, having students use a look at a peer review article um, and evaluate the source based on just the article itself, and then having them look at, okay, who cited this article? What journal was this article published in? What do we know about that journal? What other things have this author has this author written? So um, kind of researching across rather than just on the source itself. Um, a specific activity that you could do with this um, would be to divide students into groups and have one group or some of the groups evaluate a specific source using vertical reading, so staying on that source itself, um, and then have some of the students evaluate the source using lateral reading, and then compare their responses to the source. Um, obviously, this would work best if it's kind of a questionable source, one that you know already, you know, if it's a peer-reviewed article, you know it has not really gotten great feedback. 
Um, and so, you know, you can see that if the, the lateral reading group hopefully will recognize that there's problem at, problems with that source that maybe the vertical reading group does not because they stay just on that one source itself. Um, so this is a lot of text on this screen, sorry. Um, but um, kind of scaffolding this into a research paper or project, having students before they go out and start searching, um, identify the, the types of sources that they think would likely be most appropriate based on their topic or based on their research question. Um, and they wouldn't necessarily have to stick to that list, but um, having them think in advance about the types of sources that might be appropriate. Then when they submit their, their project or their paper, including as part of that a short reflection or you know, response and when, which they discuss how well the sources that they ended up using actually matched with the types of sources that they thought they would use. Um, and if there is a big discrepancy, you know, that, that's okay, but they need to explain why they ended up using the sources that they're using instead of the sources that they thought they would use. Um, oops, sorry. And again, this is very similar, but um, building into any type of research project source evaluation as part of the, that process. So, you know, before students submit a research paper, they have to submit a bibliography. As part of that bibliography, they use vertical and um, lateral reading to evaluate their source. And they have to submit that evaluation of their sources with that bibliography before they get to the stage of doing that research assignment. So you have that time to look at those sources to consider their evaluation uh, process um, and help them determine whether or not that they should keep those original sources. I think that this is the last one um, for assignments, but uh, one of the things that we mentioned is that it can be challenging um, for students to identify the disciplinary authorities. So here are the journals that are most highly thought of in the field. Here are the databases that are most relevant to this field. Um, and so different activities that you could use to help students identify those um, disciplinary authorities. So perhaps you give them a list of, you know, five journals and each group has to um, evaluate that particular journal, um, look at the impact factor for that journal, and make a, a, you know, a ranking of which of the journals that are considered to be you know, most important in this field. Um, I've done this a lot with students, have assign each group a database to search um, and have them all use the same search terms and see how the results differ by database. Um, and sometimes students are really surprised to see, hey, this database had 500,000 articles and this database only had two. And maybe, you know, this database that's the one that I'm most familiar with is not the one I should be using because, you know, I'm missing a lot of results um, that are actually in other databases. Um, giving students, you know, articles in the field and having them identify, are there journals that you see in the citations over and over again? Are there any scholars that you see over and over again in those citations? So kind of helping to identify the, the disciplinary authorities. So I know we've uh, kind of getting down to the very end. Um, so those are some ideas for various assignments and activities that you could use. Um, so I wanted to let everyone have again a minute to think about how you might want to do this. Um, you can add your thoughts to your action plan. You can share those in to the chat box. So we'll let everyone just have a minute to think and then we'll just share some, some final ending information for everyone. I'll go ahead and check the chat. You can see we've got a lot. Okay. So yeah, Stephanie shared a links to the assignment examples, the evaluation. Um, Jennifer has shared an assignment example that supports authority, it's constructed and contextual. Um, let's see, Stephanie shared lateral reading links, uh, the New York Times article link there. So yeah, that, um, that, uh, that New York Times link for that article does go to the OSU login link. Um, and that's because my, I personally had used all my New York Times free articles and so couldn't access it unless I went through the uh, Ohio State subscription too. Um, but yeah, if you, can, uh, if you do have a New York Times subscription, you should be able to access it just by going to their site. 
Um, do you have any suggestions for helping to understand currency? It's hard for them to know if something is current if they haven't read much yet on the subject. Um, yeah, that's a great question, Peggy. Um, you know, we, we've talked, I've actually been working on a project with a colleague trying to think about, you know, thinking about your topic, well, how recent do you need your sources to be? Um, but it's, it's, it's really challenging because there can be so many factors that contribute to that. Um, you know, you don't want to give students hard and fast guidelines that they can only use sources that are this old or that old. So, you know, maybe some questions to guide them through thinking about that source process. Um, Peggy asks, I have them look at sources cited, how recent, live links, uh, but wonder if there are more ideas. Um, yeah, that's a great, great question, Peggy. I don't really have, unfortunately, anything off the top of my head. Um, Okay, so I know that we are coming to the um, end of the workshop. Um, let's see, we've got a few last comments. Um, Nick said, my students cover various aspects of drug use in the course. It'd be interesting to send them on different database search tools to see how different students get different hits on their topics. Um, yes, I think that that would definitely um, be a great activity. Um, especially because, uh, you know, that's a topic that would be covered in a variety of different databases, but the articles would be very different depending on what database they use, what the focus of those articles would be. Um, Peggy should I feel like COVID has offered some great examples of what it means to stay current. Um, Brian shared, I use Einstein's airfoil as an example. He designed a terrible airfoil foil for Germany that looked like a cat's arch, arch back. So all right, thank you for sharing that, Brian. Yeah, I'm not, I've never seen that before. So I'll have to look that up. Okay, so um, just a quick um, last few things here. Um, if you do wanna access any of the materials for the workshop, um, you can go to the link that's on the screen here. Stephanie will also share that in the chat box. Um, and that will include all of the assignment examples, um, a handout on the knowledge practices and dispositions, the action plan worksheet, um, a, a PowerPoint on the framework itself if you want more information about the framework. So all of those should be available. Um, our next workshop in this series is going to focus on the concept of information creation as a process. And that will be next Thursday on June 25th at uh, this same time, noon to one o'clock. So I definitely hope to see you all back for that one. Um, if you do want a deeper dive into information literacy, we do offer through the uh, Drake Institute for Teaching and Learning a teaching information literacy endorsement. It's a uh, self-paced online course. It's designed to take 10 to 12 hours to complete. Um, and once you complete that, then you can apply for the teaching information literacy endorsement. Um, and then if you did miss any of the previous workshops and would like to access those materials, um, those are available here as well. So let me check the chat to see if there's any final questions or comments. Stephanie shared all those links in the chat there for everyone. Um, my contact information is in there as well. So please don't hesitate to send me an email. If you do have any questions or comments, I'm always happy to help. Um, and I know we've got a couple minutes past, so um, I think we will bring the workshop to an end for now. Um, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes in case there are any questions or problems. I wanna thank everyone for attending and uh, thanks Stephanie for um, helping out today and sharing all the links, monitoring the chat um, and hope to see you all again next week. And go ahead and start stop recording, but I will again stick around for a couple more minutes.